wade through waters deep. Trials fall across the way. Though sometimes the path seems rough and steep, I see his footprints all the way. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me, far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown, I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Welcome, church. He is the sweetest name we know, huh? No better place to be, Wednesday night. Thank you so much for everybody that's here. Thank you for all the visitors. We got a Brother Corley with us tonight. Be, be preaching for us. We ask God to lay upon his heart that we can open our, open our minds and hear it and take it out in the world and use it. Um, I'd like to ask Brother Paul O'Connor if he could lead us to the throne of grace, please. Yes, sir. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today. Thank you, dear Lord, for another another day we have a chance to come and worship in your heart, in your house, freely, Lord. We love you, Lord, and ask you to please guide us, Lord, through the trials and tribulations we are headed towards, Lord, and we are in in our lives now. Please, please give us liberty in our lives, Lord. And these kids, Lord, that are that are going along with us, looking up to us, Lord, for answers and looking to you, your word and your your faith that you've given us, Lord, and your love. We ask you, Lord, to help us to be like David in the lion's den, Lord. It's faith all the way. Please help us not to look back. Help us to move forward, Lord. And please be with the missionary tonight, Lord, as he gives his message, Lord. Please guide us and please be with Brother Wooten as he comes back and his family, Lord. We love you again, Lord. And I just ask, Lord, for forgiveness, Lord, for, for my sins, Lord, and just everything that we have done, Lord, that we don't know. We just thank you again for our blessings, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Remain standing 246, 246, higher ground, 246 in our hymn books, we'll sing all four verses, 246. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground, Lord lift me up and let me stand. By faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay, where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. By faith on heaven's stable land. A higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world. Though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith has caught the joyful sound. The song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. By faith on heaven's stable land. A higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost high and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I've found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land. A higher plane that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Then you may be seated. All right, church, go through the announcements. We already mentioned, we got a guest, guest speaker tonight, Brother Corley. And continue to pray that, that God's with him and gives him the word so that we can hear it, take it out. Mentioned in taking it out, uh, this weekend, we continue on, as every weekend, our soul winning and bus calling. 
We ask continue to pray for our bus as, as me and Brian, you know, we've been pretty busy other things lately. And I know I have been and and uh, to help keep praying for us that we keep striving to to bring those kids in on that bus. So many of them, they this might be the only the only getaway they get or the only place that they ever hear the gospel is here through us. So continue praying with us about that. We usually meet here about 930 and hang out for a little bit, have some coffee, maybe a donut prayer and then uh, go out and and try to spread Jesus's word out to the people, go out door knocking and hope that people receive us, pray for us on that. And if you can be here with us for that. Remember uh, on the 14th, the time change on Sunday, that's uh, going ahead an hour. So a uh, little bit of information. I don't know why I looked it up today. I wanted to see how far ahead Israel was above us. So we'll be back to eight hours instead of nine as it is now. <laughs> a little bit of information there. On the 30th, the Lord's Supper, we ask that all church members, they can come for that and, and, and get right with our Savior Jesus Christ and, and pray upon it and, and be here with us for the Lord's Supper. On the 2nd, the soul winning at Tomei Hill. I know that we've been praying about that. It got shut down last year because of COVID. We're hoping that this year that they can they can get that reopened back up and, and people pilgrimage up and down that hill that, that we can hand out tracks, hand up some water, maybe be a blessing to them and, and show some people that you know it's not of it's not of works that's going to get them to heaven. It's not going up and down that hill that's going to get them to heaven. It's just in Jesus Christ. If we could go out there and preach that, we're we're praying that Lord opens that up to us this year. And uh that's about all the announcements that we got there. Do we have any birthdays so far this week? We got one here. Elena? She just turned eight? All right. All right. When she turned eight? Yesterday? All right. Elena, anybody else? Any anniversaries between Sunday and now? No? All right. Well, let's send that great hymn of the faith. Elena? All right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. All right, let's stand up and we'll sing song 180. God will take you. 180 as we stand together right before the offering. 180, God will take care of you. Not a very familiar song, but we'll sing it. If you know it, sing it out. 180 right before the offering. Be not dismayed, whatever be tide, God will take care of you. Beneath his wing of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. Through days of toil when heart doth fail, God will take care of you. When dangers fear your path assail, God will take care of you. God will take care of you. Through every day or all the way, he will take care of you. God will take care of you. All you may need, He will provide. God will take care of you. Nothing you ask will be denied. God will take care of you. God will take care of you. Through every day or all the way, He will take care of you. God will take care of you. No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Lean weary one upon His breast, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will
will take care of you. Man, great singing. Let's pray together for our evening offering. Dear Lord, we thank you, God, for the wonderful time you've allowed us to have here tonight. Lord God, meeting together to worship you, Lord God, for the preacher, being able to be here, be with him as he speaks, and be with all the people that give. Lord God, bless them, and be with all the prayer requests that are made tonight, Lord. We just thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I will go through the prayer requests this evening. And forgive me, guys. A lot of you know this is my first time reading through these. <laughs> so Mr. Goddishman is praying for Christian Schultz and his lung infection. Is that right? Lung function went down to, is that 77%? And has an infection. Pray for America in Israel. Pastor and his family for their travels to be safe as they come back. Pray for our bus ministry, for soul winning, someone to get saved this week. Uh, men's fasting and prayer. Jay and Michelle for Janae to come to church. Is that correct? That Jay may, that Jay may get off on Sundays. Pray for my grandchildren. The True Light Baptist Church, and Pastor Wooten and his family, the Dyes, praying for Pastor Wooten and family. And I'm not sure their, their travels for America, for Israel, soul saved, baptisms. Um, oh, Mr. Mr. Dye's wife. Um, believe that she's still feeling under the weather, right, Mr. Dye? Yeah, and pray for her. I'd also like to take that time as well. Um, I know there's a couple people out. Uh, one comes to my mind right now, forgive me for the ones that I don't remember, is, is a brother brother Richard in our prayers that he hasn't been, he's been feeling under the water, weather, not feeling real good. Um, Pete Leveling, is that right? I'm not, I'm not sure what that is there, Mr. Dye. I'm reading it as, okay. <laughs> Brother Reed's health and soul winning. All right. <laughs> uh, 
That's a way to turn it around. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> That's what, what were they selling? Oh, yours was way better. Yeah. <laughs> <You're the best. laughs> right. Praise God. Praise God. Man, wait, maybe we all be a have a testament. A testament as pastor died. Just just to be fervent in everything and take every opportunity. I pray I pray for that. Urgishes, praying for uh, John and Don Stillman. Uh, Wanda's hip replacement, is that correct? Hunger to witnesses? Is that? Oh, hunger for witnesses, okay. And then uh, labors into the field. We need that. We need that. Janice, school, family, praying for school, family, kids, Israel, and uh, and Janae. We ask that if you keep all these in in your prayers and 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 some of the unspoken ones we have and and uh, some of the some of the church members that we have out sick. This time we'll turn it over and ask uh, Brian will lead us in our time of prayer. It's uh, my eyes ain't that good. Maybe. 17 after? You want to start maybe 27 after? Yep. Okay. So we'll, uh, Brian will, Brian will close us out of prayer at uh, 27 after.
thank you, Lord, as we're able to gather here together and pray together as a church family. And I thank you, Father, for those that are faithful on coming on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights, Sunday mornings, Lord, God, those that are faithful in attending, Lord, and more faithful, Lord, outside, Lord, God, the church wanting to live for you every day, go closer to you, and continue to strive to do that. Give us strength as we go forward as a, as a church. I pray that you help our ministries, that they'd grow, Lord, we see many souls saved, many souls baptized, added to the church, Lord, as we continue to strive for that. Help us to uh, encourage one another, help us to be uh, faithful to you, help us also, Lord God, as we pray, for Lord, for our church family, help us to pray, Lord, for the pastor and their family as they coming back, Lord, here in a few days, as they're encouraged, Lord, from all the, all the preaching that was going on this week at the conference they were at, for them to be able to go to that. I pray that as they come back, Lord, we catch that fire, Lord, that's burning, Lord, from being such an encouraging, Lord, week. I pray that you would uh, be with us as, as we move forward, Lord. I pray that you'd be with all the many requests that were made tonight, all the sicknesses that are going around and many people that are not feeling well. Even now with the wind or the allergies, a lot of people are having bad allergies right now. I pray that you help all those calm down. I pray for a lot of people, Lord, that get it severe. I pray that you be with those that are not able to make it tonight, those that are working, Lord, working late, whatever that may be going on, help them uh, grow, Lord, in the, in the Lord as we all strive together for that. to be with our bus ministry. We uh, look forward to getting the second bus going here pretty soon, Lord, as we, everything starts to open up in the state. Help everything to start opening in the state, we ask that we may go out, Lord, and uh, spread the gospel easier. And as many people may be open to hearing the gospel, riding the bus, coming to church, all these things give us workers, give us drivers, give us those that uh, work on Sundays. I know we have many people that work here on Sundays, actually, that can't make it to church on a Sunday. I pray that you would, their work be uh, gracious enough to give them that off and uh, switch the schedule around, whatever it may be. I pray that you would be with those uh, in, the, in the ministries that are here at the church, that you would continue to bless them. There are many people going through many things in our lives each and every day. I want to thank you, Lord, for all that you do. You've been so good to us. We can never, we will never deserve, Lord, all the things you've given us. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross for us. We do ask these things in his name. Amen. Amen. We'll stand together one last time before the message. Page number 89. Grab our hymn books and stand. Page number 89. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. We'll sing all the verses. Page number 89. Just together. Page number 89. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one, that silver line. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we will never more wander, but we'll walk the streets as our purest gold. So often tempted, tormented and tested, and like the prophet, my pillow's a stone. And though I find here no permanent dwelling, I know he'll give me a mansion my own. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder we will never more wander, but we'll walk on streets as our purest gold. Don't think me poor or deserted or lonely. I'm not discouraged. 
I'm heaven bound. I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city. I want a mansion, a harp and a crown. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow old. And someday yonder, we will never more wander. But we'll walk on streets that are purest gold. Amen. Great singing. You may be seated. Brother Corley, come up and preach to us whatever God's laid on your heart. Introduce yourself, whatever you need to do. Brother Brian, can you give these to everybody that has not gotten one? Um, so I tried to give out our prayer card to everybody, and I'm afraid I've missed a few. So if you, if you did not get one of these yet tonight, would you mind raising your hand? Uh, make sure you get one. I want everybody to have one of those if possible. I appreciate you all taking those and praying for us. Uh, my name is Frankie Corley. I and my family are missionaries to the country of Nepal. It's illegal to be missionaries there. Uh, it's not illegal to be Christian. So you can be a Christian there. You can go to church. That's okay. Uh, you just cannot proselytize. Uh, that is, you cannot take someone from their way of thinking about uh, religion uh, and eternity and convince them to your way. And so uh, in Nepal, the gospel, by definition, is illegal. Uh, and so people ask, you know, where is Nepal located? It is right below China. It's, it's sandwiched between China and India. Uh, both of those countries, China and India, have uh, 1.4 billion people in them. Uh, Nepal has 29 million people. Nepal is about the size of Arkansas. If you were to take Arkansas and just break it in half, um, and stick it together, you would have Nepal. Um, people, have you heard of uh, Mount Everest before? It's the highest mountain in the world. Have you heard of Mount Everest? Uh, that's in Nepal. It's not just Mount Everest. Uh, it's dozens of the world's highest mountains there in the Himalaya mountain range. Um, what's interesting, though, the country is shaped like this. If you, if you turn your prayer card over on the back, you can see there's a silhouette of it up in the top right corner. Um, it's shaped like this. And on the back of the country is where the mountain ranges go, where my fingers are at. On the belly of the country, it gets down to just 200 feet above sea level. Uh, so in 100 miles, think about a place 100 miles away from here. In 100 miles, it goes from 200 feet above sea level to the highest point in the world. That's 29,000 feet above sea level. That's almost six miles straight up. Um, and it does that in 100 miles. So people say, what's the climate like? What's the weather like in Nepal? Uh, well, you just go five miles and it'll change drastically because in Nepal, you're either, whenever you go somewhere, it's either like this or like that, uh, one way or the other. You don't go over to the store or over to your neighbor. You go down to the store and up uh, to your neighbor. That's just the way that it is. Um, there's a lot of things that I could say about it, uh, but... It's where the Lord has called us. I'm excited. We'll, we'll show our video at the end of the service. And um, if after the video you all have some questions, I, I can answer some questions then. Uh, or you can just stop by the table on the way out. I'll be glad to uh, fill in any questions. Uh, I will say my wife and I and our daughter Emily. Um, so if you notice on the prayer card, there's a baby. His name is Beck. Uh, he has red hair. <laughs> he came out uh, red all over. We almost named him Esau. <laughs> Uh, or King Louis, we weren't sure which one, uh, but my wife's maiden name is Beck, and so that's a tradition in our family to name the sons after the um, mother's maiden name, so we named him Beck, uh, and uh, he was not with us, but in um, 2020, we spent five months interning in Nepal underneath a veteran missionary, uh, and of course, we got stuck in the lockdown. We got locked inside our apartment for three and a half months. Uh, over there, the lockdown... Uh, was you cannot leave your um, house or your apartment uh, at all for anything, uh, well, except for food and water. And then if you're getting food or water, you can do it between the hours of 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. Um, the You did not want to run into the police while you were out. Uh, if you ran into the police, it was a good way to get put into quarantine. Uh, quarantine was um, a big, giant room where everybody else who they thought might have COVID was placed. And you just had to live in this public area. 
and the guards guarding the quarantine area had orders to shoot if you tried to escape. So if you didn't have COVID going in, you were coming out. And um, the police had a big 10-foot-long uh, poles with claws on the end of them. You've seen those little things that you can use to pick up stuff up off the ground that has a handle? It was like a giant one of those for people. And they would load people onto the trucks if they were worried that they had COVID. Uh, so that was just a little bit of our experiences last year in Nepal. Uh, and again, it, if we have time after the video, we'll, we'll do some questions and answers. If we don't, you're welcome to stop by and uh, ask us anything at the table. Uh, but before tonight, I'd like to get into the preaching. And uh, so if you will, turn to Romans chapter 1. Uh, don't stand yet. I'd like to have you stand in a few minutes uh, when we read, but we won't read yet. Uh, I want to start off uh, with a story. Uh, now, I grew up in New Mexico. I grew up in Farmington, New Mexico, and uh, I, my wife grew up in Nebraska, and, and I had to tell her when I first brought her back uh, just something about New Mexico drivers, uh, Amber. And it, First of all, they're special. <laughs> Second of all, when you get to the stoplight and the light is red uh, and then the light turns green, do not go. Wait two seconds. <laughs> Look both ways. You guys can bear testimony to this. <laughs> Someone will always be running the red light. Uh, and I remember, honestly, now, nowadays, I really do my best. I've changed a lot. I do my best to always observe the speed limit. And uh, it's nice I don't get tickets, right? Uh, but whenever I was a teenager growing up in Farmington, New Mexico, I was the opposite. Uh, I, I loved getting across town as fast as possible. I knew all of the, the quickest routes across town. I could get anywhere faster than anyone else. I, I knew where all the shortcuts were. I knew where the speed traps were, where the cops would be. And uh, I felt like if there was a speed limit sign in Farmington, New Mexico, it had been put up for me to break. Uh, can I get a witness? <laughs> uh, and uh, I remember one time I was on my way to church, and as usual, I was in a hurry, and uh, I was uh, speeding, and I got stuck behind a vehicle that was going five miles below the speed limit. Isn't that a blessing to your soul? It wasn't a blessing to my soul. Uh, I began to get frustrated, and I couldn't find a way to get around him, and I began to get irritated, and I kind of began to stew in that frustration. You know how it is, how it builds up, and uh, how easy it is to get irritated at someone, especially in another vehicle, and um, they can't hear you. You know, I didn't, I didn't say anything, and, and, and let me be clear, I, I don't cuss, and I didn't cuss back then, but if I'd been a cusser, I'd have been cussing. I was so mad at this vehicle that was going so slow, and finally the traffic cleared up, and, and I whizzed on around them, and as I was going by, I looked over, and what do you know? It was my papa and my grandma on their way with me up to church, so I, I felt so bad for all the things that I had been thinking about them and feeling about the the people in that vehicle. And, and you know, it is frustrating when someone's going below the speed limit. We, we've all experienced that if you've driven at all. Um, but how many of you would say, Brother Frankie, I am like you are now. I do my best to observe the speed limit. Yeah, a few here and there. Uh, and how many of you would say... Uh, well, actually, I'm like you were whenever you were a teenager. If there's a speed limit sign, it was made to be broken. Uh, a few honest souls in a few places that lightning is going to strike soon. <laughs> uh, that's so funny. Uh, you know, I was in Kentucky preaching this message, and I, I asked about people who observe the speed limit, and not a single soul raised their hand. And I asked about people who break the speed limit, and everybody in there raised their hand. So New Mexico is more spiritual than Kentucky, I think. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Well, and, and the, the verses we're getting ready to read here uh, were written by a man who uh, was full speed ahead in life. Uh, the Apostle Paul was serious about getting there. You don't have to read very much of your New Testament to get that message loud and clear. He had a pedal to the metal kind of ministry in life. He was serious about the gospel. That's just what the Apostle Paul was. It's who he was. And would you agree with this? We need to be serious about the gospel. I'm afraid too many Christians are living their Christian life. They're serving Jesus Christ. Uh, but they're not going five miles below the speed limit. They're going 30 and a 60. And you know as well as I do, that's not just frustrating. That's not just irritating. That's downright dangerous. 
And some Christians, I'm afraid, have just pulled off the highway and they're watching traffic go by. We need some people who are serious about serving God. Our country needs people who are serious about serving God. Our country needs Christians who are so wrapped up in the God they serve that it doesn't matter if the president of the United States is a Republican or a Democrat or a communist, they're going to serve God. And I recognize not everyone's called to be a missionary, not everyone's called to be a pastor, but the call to be a follower of Jesus Christ is a call to be a servant of Jesus Christ. At least that's how the Apostle Paul viewed it here in verse 1. He says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. And you know, in our times, we would think of a servant as being like a, a waiter, right? Or a waitress or a butler, somebody who waits on our needs. In our culture, a servant is somebody who gets to come in and clock in at 8 in the morning and clock out at 5 in the evening and go home. But in the Apostle Paul's day, a servant is quite literally a slave. The Roman Empire was built on slavery. It said that slavery was the backbone of the Roman Empire. There was more slaves in Rome than citizens. And a slave doesn't have any rights. And a slave doesn't have any home. And a slave doesn't have any ability to come in and start work and then go home after work. A slave is on the clock 24-7. A slave does not even have a last name. Because their life is serving their master. They have no will of their own. And that's how the Apostle Paul viewed himself. And that's why when he introduces himself in this letter, he says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. We're going to see in these verses we're getting ready to read an, an incredible zeal. And even, in it, can I say, in, a, in an intensity for the gospel. And the Apostle Paul is going to reveal an important reason that he was so motivated in his life. That brings us to the title of the message, which is Reason to Run. Reason to Run. So stand with me if you are able and if you're willing. Uh, we're going to read in Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 7. The Bible says, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, I should interject at this point that the Apostle Paul, writing a letter to the church in Rome, writing a letter to the believers in Rome, has yet to visit this church family. He does not know most of the people that he's writing to. And that fact is going to be very important. I think you're going to see that soon. Verse 8 says, First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit and the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Make a request, if by any means, now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Verse 11, for I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end he may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oft times I purpose to come unto you, but was let either to, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise, verse 15, so as much as in me is, I would say he's pretty serious about it, wouldn't you? He says, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather tonight in your house. We thank you for the wonderful privilege, for the blessing that it is to fellowship with our brethren. And we thank you for the blessing that you have on your church. It is what you gave your life for and it is what you love. We thank you for your word and the chance to hear it preached. And I ask that you would speak to our hearts, that you would inspire in us great zeal, great passion, and great intensity for the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
I ask that you would empty me of myself and fill me with your Holy Spirit's power. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. I would say very clearly that the Apostle Paul obeyed God's call with passion and intensity. And again, you can look anywhere in the New Testament. You can look at Acts and you can begin to dive into the books that the Apostle Paul wrote. And it becomes very clear. Here is a man who is passionate about what God has called him to do. Here is a man who is serious about what God has called him to do, what God has laid on his heart. And, you know, honestly, believers ought to be passionate about obeying God. We know that. We believe that. We would subscribe to that. But for some reason, passion, zeal, and intensity are not words that can be used to describe how we serve God or how we handle the gospel. In these verses, we see Paul's passion in his prayer life. Look in verse 9. It says, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit and the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Now, this is really interesting. Remember I said the Apostle Paul hasn't been to visit this church yet. He doesn't know most of these people that he's writing to. I don't know about you. I'm very serious about my prayer life. And there's few things that I could say with God as my witness that I make mention of them always. Without ceasing. And yet for some reason, the Apostle Paul is so passionate, he's so serious about the gospel, that when he prays, every single time he holds God as his witness, he's making mention of the church in Rome and the chance to preach the gospel there. Verse 10, making requests, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. We see his passion in his prayer life, or we see his passion in the desires of his heart. Look in verse 11. It says, for I long to see you. People he, he doesn't even know. Verse 15. So as much as in me is, Paul says, with everything that is inside my heart, with everything that I have inside of me, I long to preach the gospel in Rome. I would say that the Apostle Paul served the Lord with gazelle intensity. Now, now that's not a term that I came up with. How many of you have heard of Dave Ramsey before? Would you raise your hand? He's a financial guru, and he gives this spill. He's really a tremendous motivational speaker, and he gives this spill uh, about gazelle intensity. And, and you can find it on YouTube, and it's just it's a biblical principle about how serious you have to be to get out of debt. And Dave Ramsey says about the gazelle intensity principle, he says, I was watching the Discovery Channel and I was considering this principle about how serious you have to be to get out of debt. He says, I was watching the Discovery Channel and on the Discovery Channel there were some gazelles just gazelling around. And uh, of course, if there's gazelles on the Discovery Channel, they're not alone, right? Cue the scary music. Uh, there, there's a cheetah sneaking through the savanna grass after the gazelle. Uh, but gazelles have a little cheetah indicator behind their ear. Their head pops up. They see the cheetah and they yell, cheetah, run! And they begin to take off as fast as they can. And the cheetah begins to chase the gazelle as fast as he can. And the gazelle is running this way and that way, going pell-mell. The cheetah's in hot pursuit and the whole entire time Dave Ramsey spitting and screaming about how serious you have to be to get out of debt. Dave Ramsey says there's no way on earth that the gazelle can outrun the cheetah. The cheetah's the fastest mammal on dry land. And then just about that time the gazelle does in fact get away. Dave Ramsey says eight times out of nine when a cheetah chases a gazelle the gazelle gets away. And you, and you say, how is that? The cheetah is so much faster than the gazelle. I say, well, I reckon it comes down to a matter of motivation. Right? See, the cheetah, he's just running for an empty stomach. He's trying to get some dinner. But that gazelle, what's he running for? Yeah, he's running for his life. Dave Ramsey says, you want to get out of debt? You run, you go, go, go. You get gazelle intense. 
don't quit. Keep running. Keep going. Push. And I would say that this is how the Apostle Paul served Jesus Christ. This is how the Apostle Paul obeyed God's call on his life. This is how the Apostle Paul handled the gospel. If you're like me about this time, you're kind of wishing that you could get a little bit of that Apostle Paul zeal, right? A little bit of that Apostle Paul intensity, a little bit of that Apostle Paul excitement for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look over in Acts chapter 26. It's just a few pages over to the left. We have the Apostle Paul's salvation testimony. Now, he wasn't called to give his salvation testimony. Nobody asked him, hey, Paul, when did you get saved? No, actually, he's in prison. He's in chains at this point. And Festus and King Agrippa have called him to give an account of some charges laid against him. He's supposed to give a testimony as to his innocence. And you know what he does? He gives the gospel. He gives his salvation testimony. Here at Acts chapter 26, verse 9, it says, I barely thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, this is really interesting to me because the Apostle Paul at this point in his salvation story is not the Apostle Paul, right? He's Saul of Tarsus. And what was Saul of Tarsus? He was a Pharisee. That's what his whole entire life was about, right? He, as a Pharisee, what do Pharisees do? They serve God Jehovah. His whole entire life is about serving God. And yet he rejects Jesus Christ. That's what we just read. He says, verse 9, I barely thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary, that is, against the name of Jesus. And you and I know, or I hope we do, that you cannot serve God and reject Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, God himself, God in flesh, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Verse 10, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Whoever said he was a murderer, they were right. Verse 11, I punished them off in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even under strange cities. How many of you are glad the Apostle Paul's not getting ready to bust in here and haul some of us off to jail? Amen. Isn't that a blessing? You know, I, we, we complain a lot about what we've been through with COVID this last year. And we can tend to feel discouraged and frustrated by the political state of our, <coughs> excuse me, of our country. But I could take you over to a lot of other countries, and Nepal is one of them, where there's people just like Saul of Tarshish who are busting in to church meetings and hauling people away and seeing Christians killed simply for the fact that they're Christians. In Nepal, if, if, if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you make that decision public by baptism, uh, you reject Hinduism. It brings great shame and dishonor on you. Because you're not just rejecting your religion, you're not just rejecting Hinduism, you're rejecting your nationality, your, your very Nepaliness, and you're rejecting your family. And you're bringing great shame and dishonor on your family, and you're bringing great shame and dishonor on your community. And as a result, your community begins to put pressure on the family, and your family begins to put pressure on you. And quite often that takes the face of beatings. I have a friend who, when he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, uh, his older brother beat him up. His little sister spit in his face. His parents kicked him out of the house. He spent the next year living in a barn just because he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Another friend of mine had his hamstring cut. Uh, walks with a limp to this day everywhere he goes. 
just because he wouldn't reject Christ. Paul says in verse 13, At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And imagine if there's one here tonight who has not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, who has not received the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is standing at your heart's door today, knocking. You can likely hear his voice echoing in your heart. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Verse 15 Saul of Tarsus says, and I said, who art thou, Lord? Saul knows full well he's talking to God, hoping beyond hope that God is not who he thinks it is. Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise, stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee. This next verse is on our prayer card. It's a theme, a motto for our lives, our ministry. It says, Jesus Christ speaking to the Apostle Paul. To open their eyes. To turn them from darkness to light. From the power of Satan unto God. That they may receive forgiveness of sin. And inheritance among them. Which are sanctified by faith. That is in me. Verse 19. Whereupon, O King Agrippa. I was not disobedient. He says I was obedient. Unto the heavenly vision. But showed first unto them of Damascus. That's an entire town. And at Jerusalem. That's an entire city. And throughout all the coast of Judea. That's an entire country. And then to the Gentiles. The apostle Paul took the gospel. To, into all the world. That they should repent. And turn to God. And do works meet. For repentance. We begin to look for the root cause of the Apostle Paul's passion, the Apostle Paul's zeal that would drive him into all these places, that would motivate him to take the gospel so zealously into all the world. And I believe the root is found in verse 15. When he said, Who art thou, Lord? And Jesus replied, I am Jesus. Whom thou persecutest. You see, the Apostle Paul had a passion born of a meeting with Jesus Christ. And if you have accepted the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ, if you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you have had a meeting with Jesus Christ, then you have equal cause to be passionate with the gospel. You have equal cause for zeal and intensity in your life. But we see that that's not the only motivation that the Apostle Paul has for his ministry, for his life. Look in verse 14. We see that Paul's passion, his intensity came from a desire to pay off a serious debt. Verse 14, what are those first three words? I am debtor. I'm sorry, I'm back in Romans chapter 1, verse 14. Romans chapter 1, verse 14. Those first three words. He says, I am debtor. Paul's passion, his intensity, came from a desire to pay off a serious debt. And this doesn't make very much sense to me when I'm reading through this for the first time and studying it out, preparing this message. Because I understand that the Apostle Paul is really zealous to preach the gospel in Rome. I understand that he's really passionate about what God's called him to do. I understand that he wants to go and preach in Rome. But what in the world is him being debtor to somebody? What in the world is him owing money to someone have anything to do with what he's talking about? 
And it doesn't make very much sense as long as you think of that in the way that we normally do. Uh, brother, what's your name? Brother Jason, right? Yeah, Brother Jason. Okay, so like the way we normally think of that would be like this. Brother Jason uh, gives, loans me $40,000 and I buy a new vehicle for deputation. Thank you very much. You're a blessing. Uh, and, 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 right, and until I pay that loan off, right, I'm in his debt. We understand that. I'm debtor to Brother Jason. Uh, that kind of debt doesn't make very much sense for what the Apostle Paul is talking about. The kind of debt that will help us understand what he's talking about functions like this. Uh, Brother Jason gives me uh, $40,000, and, and he says, uh, Brother Frankie, this money is for, the Brian, for Brother Brian. Can you, can you give it to Brother Brian whenever you see him next? I say, yeah, I can do that. And I take the money, and I buy a new vehicle for deputation, right? And what have I done? Well, I have placed myself in debt, both to Brother Jason and to Brother Brian. The money because it's Brother Jason's, and to Brother Brian because it was for him. And the Apostle Paul, in this passage right here that we're talking about, that I believe is extremely important, is not talking about a debt of money. He's talking about the debt of the gospel, can you hear me? You see, the gospel comes with implications. If when the invitation comes tonight, you can raise your hand and say, I am going to go to heaven when I die. I do not have to spend forever burning in torture and torment in a devil's hell for the sins that I have committed. I get to spend forever in heaven doing exactly what God created me to do. What did God create us to do, folks? To worship and praise Him. And sin separates us from Him. And sin, our sin, separates us from the ability to do what we were created to do. It separates us from the ability to worship and praise Him. And it's only by the precious blood of Jesus Christ shed for our sins. Applied to our accounts that makes us right with God and gives us a home, a wonderful home for all of eternity in heaven. And if you can raise your hand and say, I'm going to go to heaven when I die, you can only do that because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You can only do that because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel is not given to us. For us to bestow upon ourselves only. The gospel's not take, given to us for us to take and enjoy and keep for ourselves. The benefits are not just for us. The gospel is given to us to give to the people of the world. And if, if during the invitation you can raise your hand and say, I have an eternal home in heaven. I don't have to go to a devil's hell. I don't have to pay for my sins. If you can raise your hand and you have received that gospel, then you along with me must say along with the Apostle Paul, I am debtor. You see, Paul's attitude toward his gospel debt is what drove him to go to all the places he went and do all the things that he did. Grab your prayer card, if you will. Pull it out again. Flip it over to the back. You'll see a little tiny church bill. You won't be able to read the signboard on the front, or I'll be impressed if you are able to. It says, Soda Jula Baptist Church. It's written in Devnagari script. I'd love to take you to Soda Jula Baptist Church tonight. But it would require far more than just flying 7,000 miles around the world to the opposite side of the world and landing in the capital city of Kathmandu. Kathmandu is a city of 6 million people, a population density greater than New York City. But you'd have to get to Kathmandu, you'd have to get off the airplane, and you'd have to climb into a Jeep that doesn't have power steering, that doesn't have carpet, that doesn't have AC or a heater, it still has crank windows, and you'd have to drive not one hour, not two hours, not 10 hours, you'd have to drive 18 hours. Not across a highway that has railings on the side and guardrails. Not across a highway that has a, a speed limit sign. Not across a highway that is smooth. No, this highway has bumps. This highway doesn't have guardrails. This highway has constant 
uh, cliffs on one side or the other. It has switchbacks. It is literally called the most dangerous highway in the world. And, and you'd, have, you'd have to go 18 hours across this highway. I remember driving one time, and there was, there was a warning sign. You know what the warning sign was there in Nepal? It was a, a burned-out motorcycle. It had been an explosion of some sort. It had been nailed to a tree. And then above it was, was a helmet that had been cracked in half, but it had also been in some kind of fire, some kind of explosion. And between the helmet, the cracked helmet, and the burned-out motorcycle, was a signboard. And at that point, I couldn't read Nepali. But I got the message loud and clear. I remember coming around the corner one time, and there was a great big uh, truck, like a semi-truck, that was buried past its cab in the embankment far down below, its back wheels still spinning. You'd have to go 18 hours across the country on the most dangerous highway in the world. You park your Jeep in a place called Slin, and you get out, you put your backpack on your back with whatever you want or need for the next week or two, and you hike in uh, three hours on foot and through the foothills of the Himalayas. And you come to a, a valley wherein lies the village of Sotajula, and you see a beautiful sight. This little church building. And in this little church building, which isn't, isn't even the size of these chairs right here, it includes the auditorium and the parsonage. And this little church building, you, you'll find a body of believers, independent fundamental Baptist believers, who are on fire for God passionate about serving him. They're zealous with the gospel. The entire church family will, will gather together and they'll go a half day's journey on foot. There are no roads up there, just pathways through the mountains. And they'll go a half day's journey on foot to a nearby village. And, and they'll, they'll take the rest of the day and they'll preach the gospel of Jesus Christ as a church family to that village. And then the next day, they'll, they'll pack up and they'll go another half day's journey to another village and do it all again. And out of Soda Jula Baptist Church, there are church plants and Bible studies and people being saved uh, springing up all over the foothills of the Himalayas. When Brother Joel Travis, the missionary that we trained underneath, First planted that church there. It wasn't a three-hour hike in. It, it was eight hours one way. As long as you're there, you're going to sleep on the ground. No electricity, no running water. All I'm saying is it took some passion to plant that church. It took some zeal beyond uh, what is humanly normal. But passion, zeal, intensity for the gospel is not just for the Apostle Paul. It's not just for the likes of Joel Travis, the veteran missionary in Nepal. It's not just for Amber and I, because it, it's going to take some passion and some intensity for Amber and I to go to uh, Nepal and take Emily and Beck with us, the missionaries there. But passion and zeal and intensity for the gospel is not just for the Apostle Paul. It's not just for famous missionaries. It's not just for Amber and I. All of us should have some intensity. All of us should have some passion in how we live life with the gospel. And so how can followers of Christ be passionate about the gospel? Followers of Christ, or should I say servants of Christ, or... Perhaps, along with the Apostle Paul, I should say slaves of Christ can be passionate about the gospel by living full-heartedly for Christ. It's so easy to show up for church every time the doors are open. It's so easy to be here, to be involved, to be coming to visitation, and to be every, doing everything that you do for Christ, be doing it half-heartedly. You want to be passionate, make sure you're wholehearted, make sure that you're heart is in what you are doing. Don't serve God half-heartedly. You want to be passionate about the gospel, share it with the lost. But also, build up this church. 
You see, represented in this room tonight, in each and every single person, from the greatest to the least, who has accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is great and incredible and powerful spiritual light. And we know it now more this year than ever before, but outside of those doors is great and powerful spiritual darkness. And as this church family grows stronger, and as this church family grows healthier and more mature in Christ, the light of the gospel shines brighter into the community and brighter all around the world. And so how can you build up the church if you're not become a member, if you don't attend faithfully, serve humbly, tithe automatically, give to missions, Build relationships. I guarantee you'd have to say there's people in this room that I don't know very well. As you build relationships and you strengthen your relationships with the people in this room, this church is built up. This church gets stronger. But don't just build relationships with the people in this room. Build relationships with the people who are not in this room. Right? Be intentional about building relationships with people you don't know. It was the coolest thing. What's the biggest word on the front of this prayer card? Nepal. We're going to Nepal because there's Nepalese people, Nepali people who are never going to be able to hear, even hear the name Jesus Christ if somebody doesn't go to take the gospel to them. And I get to Las Lunas, New Mexico, and I get to the hotel, and guess what I find? A Nepali man who owns the hotel. And you know what he tells me? He says, Matthew, already paid for your room. Who is he talking about? Pastor. Yeah. He says, I know, I know Matthew. I've known him for a long time. He uses us a lot. He always invites me to church. He says, tell me. I've never, never been to church. Would you welcome someone just to come and sit? And observe. He says, because I'm thinking about, I just need, I need a community to be a part of. That's a testimony of somebody building relationships everywhere he goes. Reaching into his community. Then followers of Christ can be passionate about the gospel by going to the mission field. You cannot look at the 29 million souls in Nepal and think for even half a second that we are the only ones that God has called to go there. You know how long it it take to talk to 29 million people? Can you fathom how long? Okay, let me just put it this way. Uh, who here has tried to count to 1 million before? Am I the only one? I've got a, I've got a few kindred spirits back here. <laughs> uh, I made it to 2,000. <laughs> uh, you know why? Uh, if you could uh, count one number every second and you can't, it's impossible to say 732,646 in under a second. But if you could, if you could count one number every second and you didn't have to sleep at all, it would take you over 11 days to count to a million. It's absolutely impossible to even see a million people in a lifetime, let alone talk to a million people, let alone give the gospel to a million people, let alone give the gospel to 29 million people. And so I wonder everywhere I go if there's not someone there that God is calling to be a missionary in Nepal. I want to close with a quote from William Booth and then Four questions. The quote goes like this. Not called, did you say? Not heard the call, I think you should say. Put your ear down to the Bible and hear him bid you go and pull sinners out of the fire of sin. Put your ear down to the bird and agonized heart of humanity and listen to its pitiful well for help. Go stand by the gates of hell and hear the damned entreat you to go to their father's house and bid their brothers and sisters and servants and masters not to come there. Then look Christ in the face who 
whose mercy you have professed to obey and tell him whether you will join heart and soul and body and circumstance in the march to publish his mercy to the world. And so four questions for us to ask ourselves. One, how am I building up this church? You see, if you're not a part of building it up, I'm afraid you're dead weight holding it back. How am I building up this church? Question number two. Do I serve God with passion and intensity? Question number three. Why did God give me the gospel? Was it for me only? Question number four. Who am I debtor to? How am I building up this church? Do I serve God with passion and intensity? Why did God give me the gospel? And who am I debtor to? If you have a hard time answering that last question, I just encourage you to go down to Walmart or the grocery store or convenience store, whatever is fine. Just park where you can see the entrance and the exit for an hour. Just sit there sometime this week for an hour and intentionally watch the faces of people going in and coming out for an hour. Of course, right now, they're probably wearing a mask, so you'll just be able to see their eyes. But, but sit there and think about the soul represented in each face. And if you live here in this area, then I would say that that is who you are debtor to. See, it's just a fact. People need the gospel from you. And your life ought to be passionate and zealous for God. Every head bowed, every eye closed, ask that you would stand to your feet and ask the pianist to begin uh, playing. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ that is so significant in our life, that has transformed us from creatures of sin to people of light, to people who are made in your image, Christ's life. We thank you for the gospel that gives us life eternal in heaven and that restores us the ability to worship and serve you as we were created to and that enables us again to fulfill our purpose. I ask that you would work in our hearts great zeal and great passion to serve you in great intensity in how we handle the gospel. I ask that you would work in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep your heads bowed, your eyes closed. God is spoken to your heart at all, I'd ask you just to take a few moments and do business with him. The invitation is open. Don't tarry. I don't want to keep you long. You know, we tend to get relaxed about sharing the gospel of Christ. We forget the reality that the gospel was given to us to give to the people of the world. And we forget that the gospel is the only way people can be made right with God. God gives us the gospel to give to others. Are we taking our debt seriously or are we ignoring it? Are we going 30 and a 60? Pray to God none of us are pulled off to the side watching traffic go by. 
You see, a serious attitude toward the dead of the gospel leads to serious action. If your life is lacking serious action, it's because you don't have a serious attitude. We've got to get intense. The gospel is important. We've got to get passionate about sharing it. We've got to be zealous. We've got to be compelled and eager to take care of the dead of the gospel. Amen. You can look up this way. I think at this time we're going to show the video, right? One thousand eight hundred ninety-three miles away from where I grew up, but it's home. You could talk to people all day long and not find someone who claims Christianity as their religion, but it's where I'm called to share my faith. It's a different people, a different culture, but it's my calling. My name is Frank Corley, and I'm a missionary to Nepal. Frank Corley's call to the nation of Nepal is a story of grit and focus. He was saved at a young age and called to missions in Bible college where he met missionary Joel Travis. A few months after that, he invited me to do a two-month internship underneath him. Before I went to Nepal, I knew only statistics. It's home to 29 million people from 125 different people groups that speak over 100 different languages. It contains eight out of ten of the world's highest mountains, including Mount Everest. Its primary language is Nepali, a difficult and elaborate language. No one knows how many Christians or Bible-believing churches are in Nepal. The highest estimate is one million Christians in name, including Catholics and Charismatics. Hinduism has an overwhelming influence in Nepal and results in Christian persecution. It's very normal that their family would completely ostracize them kick them out of the house, beat them. To accept only Christ as the only God and only Christianity as your way of living is in its essence to completely reject Nepal in culture and your family. Two weeks before Frank arrived for his internship, disaster struck. An 8.1 magnitude earthquake struck Nepal, killing over 9,000 people, destroying entire villages and making hundreds of thousands homeless. I got there, we ended up doing a lot of relief work. I think we built over 100 shelters that summer. I had the opportunity to preach via translator every single week. Then we made village trips to independent Baptist church plants. I came back 100% certain that that was what God had called me to spend my life. His calling never wavered. He married his wife, Amber, who shares his call to missions. They had a daughter and went on to serve under Frank's father, Pastor Burson Corley of College Heights Baptist Church in Farmington, New Mexico. In 2020, missionary Joel Travis asked him to return to Nepal to further prepare for the mission field. We didn't live like interns, we lived like missionaries. Getting a refrigerator, getting gas cylinders for our stove, going to the local shops, finding out where the main grocery store and what things, what the produce was, because it looks different. But soon after he arrived, disaster struck again. Coronavirus sent Nepal into a lockdown far more severe than what we experienced in the United States. Forbidden to leave their apartment except for food, often stopped and accosted as foreigners when they did. 
they used it as an opportunity to double down, studying the Nepali language, learning the complicated Devangari script, and ministering online. The Lord miraculously provided a way for us to continue our daily language lessons. As soon as we can get to Nepal, we will continue on the foundation that we've laid until we can preach and teach in Nepali. Getting a hold of a language where I could teach children or other ladies in Nepali, um, I can witness to people more effectively. The Corleys now plan to return to Nepal permanently spending their lives following God's call to bring the gospel to this needy nation. We need to start out initially in Kathmandu, but we want to plant churches in strategic cities and locations all throughout Nepal. To stay there long term, we plan to start a business and obtain a business visa. That will enable us to spend, Lord willing, the rest of our lives ministering secretly in Nepal. In order to serve the Lord in Nepal, the Corleys need your help. I truly believe that God has placed his calling upon this dear family. And by God's grace, we look forward to serving alongside them in Nepal and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and planting indigenous, local, independent Baptist churches for the glory of his name. I'd like to recommend to you Frank and Amber Corley. I believe with all my heart, God has raised them up to take the gospel to the Nepali people only in eternity. May we really know what God has done. Please prayerfully consider helping the Corley family follow God's call to spread the gospel in the nation of Nepal. I don't know if you, anybody has any questions, if you want to come answer that. Anybody has any questions about Nepal or anything from the child? Don't, don't ask too many questions or everybody else will be mad at you for staying so late. Uh, but no, yeah, I'd be glad to answer any questions if anybody has any questions. Uh, I mean, just about the country of Nepal, about what it's like to live there, um, about the animals that are there, uh, about our family, anything like that. I'd be glad to do our best to answer. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, honestly, if you look in if if you look in Scripture. Um, Christ says over and over that um, if you're going to serve him, you will have suffering, you will have persecution. That's what, throughout all of Christianity, that's what has been the norm for Christians. Um, and so that's just um, what's acceptable for us as Christians. Yeah, that's the norm. That's, uh, Paul calls it our, our reasonable service. That would be what's logical for us to do based on what Christ has done for us. Someone else? Uh, there's elephants in Nepal, there's rhinos, there's tigers, there's crocodiles, there's uh, freshwater dolphins, there's uh, tons of species of cobras. Um, how many of you guys ever read the book or watched the movie Ricky Tiki Tavi about a mongoose? Yeah, a few here and there. Uh, Amber and I were going one time and a mongoose ran across the road right in front of us. Uh, that was pretty cool. There's red pandas there, uh, all kinds of things. That's just down in the the belly of the country where the elevation is real low. If you take a line and you draw it from uh, Nepal all the way around the world, it actually to the United States, it goes right through Florida. Uh, so uh, that'd be like a line of latitude. So climate-wise, it, it is subtropical, but you know what happens as you go up in elevation? It just gets colder and the air gets thinner and plant life thins out and animal life thins out. So by the time you get up into the mountains in Nepal, it's just like mountain goats, yaks, uh, snow leopards, and a Yeti. Uh, well, let me say it this way. If there is a Yeti, he lives in Nepal, right? Uh, any other questions? What's the main occupation of people over there? Yeah, okay. So most people are just going to be living off the land. They, they grow rice and they eat it. And that's, 
main thing they do. The main um, the main uh, source of economy in the country is tourism. Because Mount Everest is there, because the Himalaya Mountains are there, because the jungle's there and the animals are there, uh, there's a lot of extreme um, sports that you can do, you know, like the highest bungee jump that you can do, um, and a lot of really extreme sports that you can do, uh, and then all the animals and whatnot. There's a lot of tourism in Nepal. Uh, I think 70% of their economy is from tourism, which, you know, a, a year like this year just completely kills it, kills the entire country. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I we're still working on it. There's several different ideas. One of them is I was part of a competition called American Ninja Warrior, and uh, we may be able to open up what's called a ninja gym. It used to be a gym for that kind of competition. Yeah. Any others? No, no. Uh, I like climbing and I like hiking, but it costs forty grand just to get the license to attempt it. Plus, you have to spend about another forty grand to get the um, guides and the equipment and um, everything to go up. And then they do not govern it well. Last climbing season, they had 75 uh, climbers, people who have all paid 80 grand in, um, backed up at a cliff that takes like a minimum of three hours to scale. Okay, so there's a two day window to get from the one camp to the next camp. There's a cliff that takes three hours to scale, one person at a time, 75 people in line. Most of them just waste all their money. So yeah, I don't need to do that. <laughs> but there's a lot of other really, really big mountains in Nepal, and they don't cost near as much to climb. I might do something like that. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, I, I'm not conversant right now. A kid asked me the other day, can you say, uh, I like turtles, and I was thinking about it, and be like, uh, Malai turtle man Uh <laughs> If I was going to start to preach, I would start out by like, so we lie down to see, be like, greetings in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Normally, Nepali people greet each other by saying, Namaste, and that just means the gods in me greets the God in you. And that is referring to Hindu gods and to demons. So believers don't like to use that term. Uh, they prefer Jai Masi, which would be greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone else? Any other question? Yes, sir. 27. Yeah, what'd you think I was? He asked how old I was. No guesses? I guess everybody knows now. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Sing a song then on the way out here. We'll stand together as we get ready to be dismissed. Page number 92. Page 92, we'll stand together. Sorry, guys. While we're going through the last song here, while Brian's leading us in the last song, ask the ushers to come up again. I'd like to take a love offering. Mr. Corley, if you have to make out a check, just make it out to the church, and the church will get him the money, okay? But it, it's to it's too Frankie Corley. But if, like I said, if you have to make it out to a check, make the check out to the church, okay? Thank you, guys. Page 92. I don't know if I said that. Page 92. We'll stand. We'll sing it as they're going around passing the offering. Page number 92. Many times I have wondered. Let's start that over. I made her. I messed her all up. I messed her all up. Page number 92. You can put in the offering. Give us more time to pull out your wallet and put in the offering. Page number 92. Let's try that again. Many times I have wondered about the sights of that city and all that my eyes shall behold. I will see all the wonders when I enter that city, therefore ever to be safe in his fold. Some morning you'll find me touring that city where the Son of God is the light. You'll find me there on the street so pretty, made of gold so pure and so bright. With Jesus, the one 
who gave me the victory, who led me across the divide. Some morning you'll find me touring that city where with him I will ever abide. Here on earth we have troubles that to us seem so heavy, but in heaven no one will be sad. Mom and dad will be singing, heaven's praise will be ringing for the dearest friend I ever had. Some morning you'll find me touring that city where the Son of God is the light. You'll find me there on the street so pretty, made of gold so pure and so bright. With Jesus, the one who gave me the victory, who led me across the divide. Some morning you'll find me touring that city where with him I will ever abide. And great singing, you're all dismissed. God bless you. Good night.